Do you believe in a universe that is completely encased, closed, in which there is nothing outside of it, or do you believe in a God who is created and is opened up and says, if you want the ultimate reality, you can't look inside the box, you better look beyond it. Now, I know what you're saying. Wait, then how can we possibly look beyond the box? Well, it's simple. Because God not only transcends the box, he's outside of the box. God also chooses, because he loves you, to enter the box. To get inside the box, with all of its ugliness and all of its messiness and all of its junk. God says, I'm going to climb inside. We call that penance. Where God says, I didn't just wind up the universe and throw it away. I didn't turn my back on it. I said, this universe is in a lot of trouble. I better jump in and make a difference. The imminence of God means he is Jehovah Shammah, the God who is right here, right now, and who chooses to enter this life. Hey, not just this life. He chooses to enter you. See, in the fullness of time, when it had come, Christ lets go of his divinity in a sense. He humbles himself as a human being. He comes. Hence the Christmas picture. So not only is God transcendent, he's imminent. Not only is he bigger than the box, he chooses to be inside the box. Because we need that. What is a vain, hollow, deceptive philosophy in Paul's eyes? It's the kind of philosophy that says, no God, you're on your own. If I could bring it into the 21st century that you were a bunch of random chemicals, amino acids that have randomly come together, and that you are no more significant than a blade of grass. Vain. Because it does not recognize something beyond science. It does not recognize God. <laughs> get the idea. I want you to notice. Lies, brothers and sisters. Lies are powerful. series of men and women who have lived through history that we have put up on pedestals. Philosophers. Artists. We forget that their ideas have power. Hear me when I say this. Every artist is a disciple maker. Every artist work in clay, you're a disciple maker. You write scripts for TV, you're a disciple maker. You do rock and roll, you're a disciple maker. You write books, you're a disciple maker. Anytime we endeavor into an artistic anything, we have a message and we want the people around us to grab our art, to grab our stuff, and we want them to take the message. That's why we do art. And in our culture today, we are absolutely bombarded by messages that ultimately say there is no God, there's nothing more than the box. And they become wise to us. Some of the greatest men and women that at least our culture has put up as great have made incredible statements against God. Frederick Nietzsche said, Christianity remains to this day the greatest misfortune of humanity. Imagine that. The greatest misfortune of humanity, he says. Carl Sagan, it is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusions, however satisfying and reassuring they may be. Lying inside the box. So in other words, what he's saying is there is no hope. There's no betterment in our culture. We're not 
nothing more than start stuff. Programmed by our own DNA to do what we do. No hope, no joy. Andrew Carnegie, you know the name. I don't believe in no God. My God is patriotism. Teach a man to be a good citizen. He will solve all the problems of life. It is a persistent uh, philosophical statement today that still exists. And it was more like this. Educate the people properly and all the problems of culture will go away. Well, I'm sorry, but you see, I, I believe in a God who is outside of the box, who's defined things differently. And, and, and the reason that he says my culture is messed up is because he says, Williamson, you're messed up. You've got this thing called a sin nature that you cannot in your own power and strength deal with, and I need to deal with it. And so, Williamson, you live in this depression, this darkness, and until I can speak life into that, no education will help you. Ernest Hemingway, you know how he died. All thinking men are atheists, he said. Foolishness. It's an absolute lie. I've been a student of science for all my life, and I can point to you scientist after scientist after scientist all through history to this day that passionately believe in God. It's foolishness, brothers and sisters. Benjamin Franklin, the one that we put up there on the pedestal, lighthouses are way more useful than churches, he said. Well, I like to think that churches are lighthouses, but that's another issue. Diderot said it this way, man will never be free until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. Did you get that? People will never be free until there is no government and no religion. Uh, I have another name for that. It's called anarchy. <coughs> These are the greatest minds, supposedly, that have ever lived. And this is what they come up with. Why? Because they believe All that ever is and will be is in the box. Paul says, be aware. Be aware. Understand that these things are going on. Understand that these are philosophies that are bombarding us. And, and they're in our advertising. And they're in our movies. And they're in our, our, our books and our magazines. And, and they're bombarding us. Paul says, be aware. Be aware. Can I just take this a little bit further with you today? I want some lies to die. I really do. Oh, don't get too passionate. Don't get too radical. I'm sorry. I'm a radical person. Like Pastor Barry said, I see life from a different way. Hear me. I want the lie that says beauty is all about the outside, all about the slimness of my hips. I want it to die. Whoever came up with that garbage? I want it to die. I want the guy who taught that as a man, my entire identity is wrapped up in my job. I want that philosophy to die.
under guard. Why? How? Let's move on. In him, scripture says, you were also circumcised. And the putting off the sinful nature, not the circumcision done by hands, but the circumcision done by Christ. No, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him according to your faith, the power of God was raised in the dead. Paul reminds us we're transformed people. Circumcision to the Jew was a twofold thing. It, it represented the fact that, hey, I'm part of a covenant people, but as that portion of skin was slipped away, it was also seen as revealing. Revealing. When God says it's not a circumcision that is physically done, but it's the work that Christ has done. And if you want to know why I, I'm so passionate about this, it's because I believe that Jesus Christ alone enters the box and allows people who will come to him, simply humbly come to him, be transformed. So Paul argues it, it's not a circumcision of surgical procedure, but it's what Christ strips away from us, what he cuts away. And then he goes on to illustrate it with this beautiful illustration of water baptism. Let me try to explain to you a little bit about what water baptism actually means theologically. In the beginning, Genesis 1, the entire universe was filled. It was without form, and it was chaos. The Spirit of God comes and, in essence, hovers over the universe. And the Word of God speaks. And out of chaos comes order. Galaxies, stars, planets, animals.
chaos. And I want to be raised to the new kingdom. It is a symbolic way of us identifying with this new kingdom and saying, that's where I want my life, my heart, my passion, my philosophy. Because I recognize that the new kingdom is bigger than the box. We are baptized into Christ. He's done this remarkable work. Here it is. Never forget this. That as the spirit of the living God creates out of nothing, ex nihilo, Genesis 1, so the spirit upon and in us today creates in us the kingdom of God. There is nothing we cannot do or accomplish in God's spirit. Nothing. 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 I can't forgive you, Pastor Bob. Yes, you can. I can't witness, Pastor Bob. Yes, you can. There's only one requirement, and that is to be faithful on your knees before God and say, Lord, I recognize I can't do it alone. The spirit of God does it in me. Build it in me. Let it come. What else does Christ promise us in this passage? He said in verse 13, when you were dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive and he forgave you. The philosophies of this world, brothers and sisters, produce a lot of fruit. But one of the things that they produce, I think, is fear. You see, if I believe that I'm nothing more than a random series of chemicals that has no free will of my own, which is a common philosophy today, I can never hope to grow. I can never hope to get better. That puts fear in my heart. I don't live like that. Fear, by definition, is the understanding that, that if I do something, I will lose something. I want you to get this because it's the root of all fear. It's the idea that says, if I risk, if I try, if I move in this direction, I will lose something of value. Maybe I'll lose my esteem, self-esteem. Maybe I'll lose my friends. Maybe I'll lose my job. Maybe I'll lose my money. Maybe I'll lose my life. That's fear. That's the root of fear. God says, you can't lose. Oh, yes, there are things in our lives that will be taken from us. But he will replace them. Always with better. Always with better. Don't let the fear hack you in the legs and keep you from crying out and, <coughs> and passionately moving in the directions God directs you. He will always come true for you. He has forgiven you. Not only has he forgiven us, but I want you to know that it says God's made you alive. Theologically, I understand what that means, but if, if you would allow me to contextualize it just a little bit. I think that when Christ comes and forgives us, one of the things that he allows us to do is really live. I mean, really live. Have you ever really lived before? Is your life nothing more than getting up in the morning, getting your coffee, doing your tinnies, going to work, coming home, watching the tube, going to bed, saying, oh, I'm going to do it in the morning. That's not really living. Really living means that you have found that thing in the life. God just fills you to overflowing with you may have noticed that the thing that I found in life that fills me to a place where I sense God's presence so strongly is what I do right now. To really live. There's a beautiful illustration of this that J. R. R. Tolkien wrote. And eventually, when he filmed in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the second movie, I'll throw the picture up if I can. We've got a king up there by the name of Theoden. And that's a picture where we meet him up at the top of the screen. Gray hair, scraggly, can't speak a word, mumbles to the liar who is on his side, worm tongue who whispers lie after lie after lie into his heart. And as Peter Jackson films the scene 
do. It's a remarkable transformation to watch this man who can barely speak a word, to watch his hair grow straight, to watch his wrinkles disappear, to watch him rise up on his crooked old chair and say, give me my sword. And there he sits, healed, healed by truth, healed by this power greater than he was. That, brothers and sisters, is what Christ does for you and me. He allows us to find that thing in life that he calls us to do, that fills us with fire and passion, that makes life worth living. He says, go do it with everything in God. And the next time you watch, watch for this scene. And think to yourself, do I want to be the dude at the top? Or do I want to be the dude on the horse? The king who leads his people? No questions. No questions. He makes us alive. Why? My sin has been forgiven. Verse 14. He's canceled the written code. The law, if you will. He's canceled the, the debt of, of sin against me. With all of its regulations. Because it opposed me. He took it away and he nailed it to the cross. Probably a scene like the Romans used to do. Where they would nail the sin, if you will, the breaking of the law, whatever crime the man had committed. They nailed it to the cross. And in Jesus' life, they nailed King of the Jews. That was his charge. Sedition. He takes your sin. He takes my sin. He nails it to the cross. And he says, it no longer Hear me. Either Jesus Christ takes none of your sin, or he takes all of your sin. There is no in between. That's the one you remember when you did last night. I don't, don't want to. Did you hear me? If you said, God forgive me, he says, I have. Calls Peter to forgive 70 times 70 times. You think Jesus will forgive less? Of course not. You stand today, sit today, completely free. Now, I don't know if that's free to you, but it's free to you. And finally, he says this, verse 15, and he has disarmed the powers of the authorities to make a public spectacle of them trying to them over the cross. What else has Jesus done? Watch the picture. Picture first century. Jesus died. He is dragged through the streets of Jerusalem down the Via Dolorosa, the road of suffering. He's holding on to his cross. Everybody's laughing. Everybody's walking. And then he gets to his cross and he's hung there. You got that picture in your mind? Now I want to transport you for just a moment to another scene. When a Roman general has just completed a great battle, a victory. He would lead a procession of people. And they would enter into the streets of Rome, and they would walk down the streets. It would take several days, this parade. And he would have the people that he captured, all the bad guys. And he would have the soldiers. And they'd go, yeah, 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 great king, great king, great king. They'd wander through the streets. They'd go to visit the emperor. And eventually, the bad guys would be deposited right here, the Roman Colosseum. In Jesus' day, the Roman Colosseum had a floor that went right across. And underneath is where you kept the lions, and where you kept the Christians and other writings or the people who were going to die. That was their place, waiting their death. And you go visit there today for the first time. Paul makes this analogy. He said, while Jesus was walking the streets of the Via Dolorosa, while he was coming to the cross, everybody was laughing at him. But in reality, in the bigger picture, in the picture outside the box, what was going on in the spirit realm was very different. Christ was conquering. He was walking, if you will, not down the streets of Rome, but down the streets of eternity. Every man, woman, and child that ever died in Christ, ever died for the Jehovah God was trailing with him. The principalities and the powers, the devil himself, were in the back, captive. And Jesus came and he defeated them. Stripped them of their power. So here.
hear you today, me today, do I have to fear satanic power? No. What story? How does God I know? Three years after I became a Christian, I was walking in my apartment one day, back and forth, midnight, dark, everything's dark, I'm praying. I'm walking back and forth. I am immediately arrested in my feet. My heart starts to beat like it's never beat before, and I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that behind the curtains of my balcony was the most evil thing I'd ever come across. I was paralyzed. I don't just have a panic attack. I've never had a panic attack in my life. I've never had one since. I was frozen. I stood there for five minutes, sweating, hearing my heart go thump, 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 thump. Somehow or another, I knew what I had to do. Like Indiana Jones. The stand. The war is that big. I will never forget it until the end of One word came out of my mouth. Sunday school. Jesus. God. I could not stand. It took me five minutes to do that to me. I'm sweating, scared out of my mind, and I grab the curtains, and I go, ah. The minute I did that, God. Heart stopped. I looked around. Can I describe to you what happened? Probably not. Was that being intimidated by fear is my belief. I will never forget that day as long as I live. Because it taught me something about the power of God. You trust him. Here it is, brothers and sisters. I will close here. Remember that picture of the Colosseum? You've got to ask yourself that. The Colosseum is the, it's the boss, it's the Romans, it's the power, it's the philosophy of the day that said there's nothing more than me. Will you accept that? Or will you just accept the philosophy that says? something bigger than the loss. It's Christ. The glory, the power, the life. Which one will you choose? Which one will you choose? This passage has dealt with three major themes. The centrality of Christ. He is over everything. I want him, and I long for him to move. And I pray that that will be your prayer. The second thing that I want you to understand is there's no greater reality in Christ. What do I mean? We can do whitewater rafting, we can go and jump out of air, uh, airplanes, parachutes, I hope. We can climb buildings, we can climb mountains, we can hike, we can travel the world over. Wonderful things, most of those. Most of those. There's still no better reality in Christ than this. Fine. Never fail. And the third one I'm not going to talk about because I recognize that Pastor John can talk about that next week. But just this. Do not let the philosophies of this life rob you of your joy. Have your ears attentive. Have them open. And I'm ready to listen to what's being bombarded you every day. Recognize it. That's <coughs> truth. That's a lie. Don't get angry. Don't get bitter. Don't get defensive. Just choose. I am a Father, we come to you now in Christ's awesome name. Wow. Love you. You're giving us this incredible truth, Father. The truth to be careful of, to, to guard ourselves with. This truth that says it is so important for me to recognize in life you're greater than the laws. That you're greater than the things that I can see in such a measure. That you are a God who is both over all and in all. You are a God who fills our hearts. You forgive us. You redeem us. You purchase us. You transform us. Father, I ask today that you would give us great insight and wisdom that we may be able to discern the lies and simply by the power of God, reject them. I don't want to reject the people, Lord, 
that proclaim the lies. They are redeemable. All people are redeemable. But I want to make sure that those philosophies and those ideas do not embed in my brain, in the brain of my brothers and sisters. I want to recognize them with there. I do not want to be deceived. Father, I ask now strong anointing upon us, upon our ears, that we may discern and that we may walk in a joy that only you can give. I thank you for the honor of being able to minister to my brothers and sisters today. I pray your blessing upon them now in Christ's name.